On one early tour of the East Side, Woody pointed out William Buckley's house. This was a point of interest for him since the Buckleys, their family, and their friends are in essence what drew him to the East Side. But the precise location of the Buckley house failed to lodge in my mind, and some months later, when again we were walking in that vicinity, I asked in passing whether a familiar-looking house might be William Buckley's. To this day I don't know what prompted the attack that followed, which was more stunningly awful than I had ever weathered in my life, and it did not cease until I was sobbing on the sidewalk, vaporized in front of a house that presumably was not William Buckley's. The Woody Allen Fall Project was an unquestioned fact of life for the many men and women who were employed year after year. As sure as the swallows returned to Capistrano, Woody Allen would come up with a screenplay to shoot each fall. He led a disciplined life. While we were making a movie, he edited on the weekends and was all the while making decisions about the next project. He thrashed out plots while pacing back and forth on his terrace, and he wrote his scripts in longhand on a yellow legal pad while lying on his side in the bedroom where the kids slept on weekends. He then typed out his pages on the same typewriter he had used for 20 years. It was always a great day when we walked over to Studio Duplicating to deliver the completed screenplay so that they could print out the first neat stack of copies. Even when he was writing, we tried to meet at some point during the day for a walk and, of course, dinner. Without fail, no matter what else was happening, he called me four or five times a day, minimum. As shooting schedules go, our working hours were unusually civilized. We never started before eight in the morning and rarely worked past six in the evening. At that point, Woody would go to his editing room to see the dailies while I hurried home for dinner with the kids. It was an ideal job for a mom. Whichever kids weren't in school came with me to work. I turned dressing rooms and campers into playrooms with colorful posters on the walls, a little table and chairs, pots of clay, stacks of paper, glue, blocks, pens, scissors, puzzles, books, and cassettes. During the breaks, I played with the children, read or knit. I made elaborate samplers on which I cross-stitched the names of each child and Woody. Sometimes he and I played chess, but mostly he made phone calls, lots of phone calls. He had a California lawyer on retainer, and it seemed that he was always trying to sue somebody. I once told him he was suit-happy, but he corrected me. It's called litigious. In 1983, when my mother moved out of the apartment to marry James Cushing, I gained a wonderful stepfather and an extra bedroom, which for a large family in New York City is nothing to scoff at. That was the year of Zelig, our second film together. In contrast to A Midsummer Night Sex Comedy, Zelig was a happy experience for me. I had few lines to speak, and the character came easily. Of all the films we made, the atmosphere on this set was the most relaxed. The next year, 1984, was the year of the Roses. Broadway Danny Rose and the Purple Rose of Cairo were artistic triumphs for Woody and for me. The very disparate characters of Tina in Danny Rose and Cecilia in Purple Rose were two of the best and most rewarding roles I had ever been given. Of the movies I have been in, Purple Rose remains one of my favorites. With those two films, I regained some confidence. Woody seemed pleased with my work, and I began to feel accepted as a member of his team. After Danny Rose, our producer Jack Rollins told me he had initially protested Woody's casting me in the role of Tina, a tough Brooklyn Italian broad, that I was not Mr. Rollins' first or fiftieth choice was understandable. In order to play Tina, I had to change everything about myself. I took the look and attitude from two women, Honey, the former wife of Frank Sinatra's buddy, Jilly Rizzo, and Mrs. Rayo, owner of Rayo's Restaurant. I drank milkshakes all day to gain 10 pounds, and I worked to lower my voice. I taped hours of conversations with Brooklyn women and listened to them day and night. I watched Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull on video countless times. Rehearsals, apart from a couple of perfunctory disjointed camera run-throughs, during which Woody paid little or no attention to the actors, were non-existent. I knew I wouldn't have the chance to try out being Tina, so I had to be well prepared. I found a Tina voice and attitude, and my new weight was assisted by large, removable breasts, tight, sexy clothes, stiletto heels, and big hair. But my eyes kept giving me away. We discovered that even with a ton of makeup, they undermined the toughness I needed, unless I squinted, which I couldn't do for the whole movie. So I wore sunglasses throughout, 
except for one scene that lasted only a few seconds, without dialogue, just a glimpse of my head in a bathroom mirror. That moment was jarring when I saw the movie, as if, in spite of me, a different character had suddenly intruded, or an unintended dimension of the same character. In our real lives, Woody and I had settled into a steady, secure, and satisfying relationship. I got used to his triumvirate incarnations as partner, director, and actor, and he had, I think, become used to me. In Danny Rose, we played opposite each other for the third time, after Midsummer Night and Zelig. Woody, the actor, had long ago invented his screen persona, a lovable nebbish, endlessly and hilariously whining and quacking, questioning moral and philosophical issues great and small. He was a guy with his heart and his conscience on his sleeve, whose talk was peppered with quotes of Kierkegaard and Kant, an insightful and unthreatening mascot of the intelligentsia, a guy who was nothing like the real Woody Allen. With the two of us connected in so many complex ways to each other and to the everyday life we shared, it was difficult for me as an actor to build another, separate reality and to feel free within it. Furthermore, whenever Woody the actor and I were doing a scene, Woody the director would be standing outside it, appraising the performances. Especially at first, working this way took every ounce of my concentration and resolve. Following the Year of the Roses, although outright compliments were rare, I felt Woody was pleased with my work and that he trusted me. Mia is an extraordinary actress, he told his biographer. She shows up and can always do it. If you ask her to play that shrinking character in Purple Rose of Cairo or the silly cigarette girl in Radio Days, she does it. If you ask her to play nasty, she does it. If you ask her to play something sexy, she does it. And she's real sweet. She'll come to the set and quietly do her needlepoint, then put on her wig and dark glasses or whatever and just scream out the lines and stick a knife in your nose and then go back to sewing with her little orphan children around her. Most directors shoot a scene from many angles. At a minimum, there's the master shot, providing the coverage of the whole scene, then the over-the-shoulder shots onto each actor, and finally all the close-ups. When an actor moves within the scene, the camera follows, and then the other actors are covered from the new perspective. It can be a tedious process. Woody worked very differently. He always found a way to shoot a scene in one, or at the most, two setups. Commonly, we filmed six- and seven-minute scenes. The longest, in Husbands and Wives, was nine and a half minutes, when we shot until we ran out of film. By skillfully moving both actors and the camera, he eliminated the need for coverage. Over 13 movies, I can count my close-ups on the fingers of one hand. For the actors and the camera crew, this approach was both terrifying and exhilarating, like opening in a play without rehearsals. Walking onto the soundstage, that first glimpse of the set with the lights pouring down on it, knowing as you approached that everything was ready to go, that moment was electrifying. The way most films are shot, if a scene doesn't work, there are plenty of options in the editing room. It can be tightened, lines can be dropped or lifted from different takes. When an actor is weak, the scene can be played on another actor. There are alternatives. But Woody's method of working left no margin for error. That's one reason so many reshoots were necessary. The other reason is because as we shot scenes, problems with the script were revealed, or Woody simply saw ways to rewrite and improve it. Whenever I had a scene with actors I hadn't met, I would find them in the makeup room, or I'd knock on their dressing room door to say hello. People were always nervous, not knowing what to expect. Nobody ever told them anything. Most often they had only read the pages of the scene they were in, not the whole script, so they didn't know what the story was about. I'd ask them if they wanted to run lines or anything. They almost always did. I did, too, because it was all the rehearsal we were likely to get. We knew that if they didn't get it right, they'd get fired, like Michael Keaton, Christopher Walken, Sam Shepard, and my own mother. Whether it was a comedy or a drama, the atmosphere on the set was intense, hushed, Woody never raised his voice. Actors knew not to expect discussions, explanations, encouragement, enthusiasm, or compliments. Criticism was quiet, quick, and cutting. I told people that if he said okay or fine after a scene, that meant it went really well. As long as he didn't interrupt the scene or say anything negative, it meant that he was pleased. Since there was no coverage, the editing went quickly. Once the movie was assembled, he put in music, usually from his own record collection. Then he screened the film for more or less the same group of eight or ten people. When the lights came on, he asked questions, and from the reactions, he got a sense of the problems and strengths of the film. He then rewrote for a few weeks and recalled everyone for reshoots. Scenes were often reshot four or five times throughout the year.
We were doing reshoots on Danny Rose for more than a year, right up until the month it was released. We didn't have much of a social life. I can recall our going to three parties in a dozen years. I introduced him to all my brothers and sisters, and I tried to share my friends, Leonard Gersh, Maria Roach, Tom Stoppard, Stephen Sondheim, Betty Comden, Nancy Sinatra, Liza, John Williams, Casey, John Taverner, the Styrons, and Yule, Eileen, and the Canans. But really, he wasn't comfortable with them. He enjoyed the Canans, but although Ruth thought well of his work, she didn't like him. It was the cause of one of our few quarrels in over forty years, Garson told me. We had dinner, the four of us, and walking home, Ruth said, He may be brilliantly talented, but he's no good. I wouldn't trust him from here to the end of the block. Apart from the ever-present Jean Domanian and her boyfriend, who I liked very much, Woody was most comfortable with his chilly but eager-to-please assistant, Jane, and his costume designer, Jeffrey. I never knew anybody, man or woman, who cared so much about clothes as Woody Allen. He pored over Vogue magazine each month. His own casual, rumpled look was in fact carefully assembled. The linen suits and tweed jackets were tailor-made. His shirts were the finest Sea Island cotton. His sweaters were cashmere in grays and browns. He never failed to notice and comment on what people were wearing, and he was intensely contemptuous of a poor choice in style, color, or fabric. That my sister Steffi could wear a pink T-shirt left him confounded and dismayed. When we went out to dinner, it was Woody who decided what restaurant and who would join us and the topics of discussion and when to leave. Invariably, he paid the check. We almost never saw his sister. We had dinner with her, or maybe it was lunch, only once in a dozen years. His parents were there, too. It was somebody's birthday, an awkward, awful affair, as was every encounter with his parents. I grew up in Beverly Hills. I went to convent schools. I have moved in circles where people are polite to one another. I never saw anyone treat another person the way he behaved with his parents. Of course, with the Horowitzes, it was a different story. Vladimir and Vonda Horowitz were the only friends we made as a couple. When we were introduced, Vonda said, Mr. Woody Allen, you look the same as you do in the movies. No worse, no better. No matter what restaurant we went to, Horowitz ate the same thing. Woody's assistant had to call ahead to make sure his sole, boiled potato, asparagus, and creme caramel were available. While we ate, Woody's chauffeur went to Times Square to pick up the next morning's New York Times, which Vladimir had to have every night or he couldn't sleep. From the start of the meal, he fretted about getting it. When we went to their brownstone to pick them up, Horowitz would immediately ask us about the weather. How is it outside, he would say. And we would tell him it was warm or coldish. Then, while we chatted over a drink, he would phone the weather at ten or fifteen minute intervals until we left. He had a television in his living room and a VCR with the control panel covered with black tape so that he couldn't push any wrong buttons. It was somehow comforting that the world's greatest pianist couldn't figure out his VCR. He watched two movies every night. I asked what kind of movies he liked. I don't care what I watch, he shrugged. The store just sends them to me. Before we went out, no matter what the climate, he took time to carefully pull on his black leather gloves, working them meticulously over each famous finger. Once, while we were in the car heading for the restaurant, he pointed out the window, exclaiming, Vonda, look, a bicycle! Then he laughed for a good long time. Woody said the reason he liked Vladimir was because he's crazier than I am. Vonda, who herself was a riot, was always grumbling about how she had spent her whole life taking care of two men, her father, Arturo Toscanini, and then Horowitz. Woody and I were watching the news when we learned of Vladimir's death in 1989. Of that moment, Woody said in his biography, We were not exactly stunned, but Mia and I were saddened. Within a minute, we agreed to call Vonda. Then one of the kids ran into the room. The cat had jumped on the kitchen table. We hurried to get the cat off while the other kids came marching in, demanding dinner. Suddenly, the enormity of the passing of a human life was becoming history. The more pressing trivialities of life interfered. Mia was immediately the hard-pressed mother, grabbing the cat and ladling out the pasta. See how life goes on, she said to me. It's a concept that causes me great trouble when I stop to think about it, which is often. That is, just how fragile and fleeting life is in the